To make sure that you're in the right place, this is the class for uh, marriages with birth to elementary age children, uh, which is why we're going to have some of the sounds of the babes in here. That's great. Um, but uh, uh, there, there's actually a story of a, a girl who's perhaps the age of some of yours who was with her mom at a wedding for the first time. And so she asked her mom when she saw the bride come in, Mom, why is she wearing white? And the mom said, well, she's wearing white because white's the color of happiness. And this is the happiest day of her life. And so the young girl thought about it for a minute. She goes, then why is the groom wearing black? <laughs> and uh, not right. I think it's, you know, I, I don't know if it's a true story or made up story, but really does kind of paint the picture. I mean, marriage is a lot of highs and happy moments. And, uh, but there's tough moments as well. Uh, in marriage. Marriage can be tough at times, and yet God designs the overall picture, the snapshot of a day may be tough, but overall that our marriages thrive in Him. And uh, that's, that's the title of this class, is Thriving Marriages. A um, uh, couple of couples here, we're going to be presenting some things for you. My name is uh, Mike May. This is my wife, Jody, right up here. Jody May. And uh, together uh, with Carlos and Jessica Ortega uh, are here as well. They're going to be sharing some things. Uh, we're going to be doing this class for you. Uh, I'll allow Carlos and Jessica to introduce themselves a little bit later. They'll introduce themselves better than I would. Um, Jody and I are actually just leaving this stage of life. Uh, we've been married 19 years, and um, we, uh, we're currently up in Fort Collins, uh, part of the Fort Collins Christian Church. Uh, we've got some of our brothers and sisters up from up there with us in this class. So, uh, But our, our son is actually 13. He's in seventh grade now, and our daughter is just leaving elementary school. She's going into sixth grade in the fall, um, although I guess in some places that's elementary, but where we're at, that's middle school. So we're just leaving this stage, and I uh, hope to be able to share some things with you that uh, God has taught us um, through this stage. Uh, I did want to get a little bit of demographic here. Who in here, you have just one child? Okay, a couple have one. Who has two children? Okay, the vast majority. Who has more than two? Come on. <laughs> Gracious. We were joking a brother earlier. It's like when you had one, you're able to trap them a little bit. You know, you get to two, you play man to man. You have more than two, you're playing zone and trying to get creative and taking care of them. So more props to you. Now, who has what you would consider an infant, say up to two years old? Okay, we've got quite a few in here with that. Okay, who has... I guess toddler to preschoolish. Okay, who has what you would consider elementary, I guess, up to fifth grade? It's a pretty even split there, and obviously some of you have some in all three of those, um, it looks like. Um, and then a gauge, because I know the first class was zero to five years, but then if you had kids, maybe you're in here. So who here has been married five years or less? Anyone? Okay, we do have a few. Who's been married, say, five to ten years in that range? Okay, who's been married over 10 years? Okay, wow. Anyone in here been married longer than us, more than 19? Wow, okay, awesome. Yeah, no break in there. Amen, <laughs> amen. All right. Well, I'll be up front. By no means are we experts or claim to be. A lot of the, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, a lot of the examples we'll share are tough lessons learned um, as we go through this. But God teaches us. Uh, in those as well. If you can look over in Psalm 127, um, I want to share a scripture to start off here that's been very helpful for us. Psalm 127. <clears throat> Verse 1 simply states, Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. And of course, in this Scripture, it's kind of presented from the negative aspect. If the Lord isn't building it, here's your warning. But the positive, the, 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 the reverse of that is absolutely true as well. If the Lord is building it, how incredible can it be? And we really are building something within our marriage. We might not be thinking of it that way, but we are. And is the Lord building it or are we doing it in some other way? In the same psalm, he says down in verse 3, children are a heritage from the Lord, a reward from Him. And so you add children into the mix here, which 
That's the stage of life that we're at in this room. And he says they're a reward, and yet it's amazing to me how in that specific reward, oftentimes the building of our marriage can get derailed. You know, I was doing some research. Listen to some of these stats. A uh, study done by some researchers from the University of Denver in Texas A&M, after the birth of their first child, 90% of couples had at least one of the partners report a decrease in marital satisfaction and the quality of their relationship. Actually, the way they worded it was a significant decrease in marital satisfaction and the quality of the relationship. 90%, at least one of the partners. Only 15% of fathers and only 7% of mothers reported an increase in marital satisfaction after the birth of the first child. And as it broke down, the number one reason, there were other reasons, but the number one reason for decrease in the satisfaction in the wives was the increase in life responsibility. And it spoke to their frustration with their husbands not sharing enough of this new load. The number one reason for the decrease in satisfaction in the husbands was lack of time together now with the children, which spoke to the frustration of their wives being more emotionally consumed with the child. And as I read that, I thought, what a vicious cycle that could become. More responsibility. I'm frustrated that my husband's not helping as much. So the wife's doing more, and the husband's getting frustrated that she's giving more attention to the child, and therefore withdraws more. And you can see the vicious cycle that can be created in this. It's not just that direction that this relationship is affected, though. Another study done on how the quality of marriages affect the children. Because I think a lot of times what can derail the marriage with the children is our desire to give our children a great life. And to give them tremendous amounts of attention and maybe even things that we feel like I didn't have this when I was a child. And yet studies done by John Gottman of the University of Washington, who's actually the author of a pretty good book called Relationship Cure, uh, if you've read that. They did study with children all the way from birth up to about 15 years old. As early as three months old, in marriages that were described as unhappy, there was a much lower capacity for joy, concentration, and self-soothing in a three-month-old than three-month-old, three-month-olds in a marriage that was a thriving marriage. You get up to the preschool age. The preschoolers, what they did is they tested their urine on a regular basis. And those raised in homes with marital hostility had markedly higher levels of stress hormones than the children in stable marriages at preschool ages. And as they followed up through age 15, what they noticed was that kids of troubled marriages had significantly higher incidence of truancy, depression, peer rejection, low school achievement, and behavior problems, particularly aggression. Whereas the kids of happily married couples showed more advanced social skills, did better in school, were less likely to succumb to depression during stressful times. And so while giving children extra attention often to the detriment of our marriage is often well-intentioned, study after study has shown that the best gift parents can give their children is a strong marriage. Now, I will note that in the study of um, the the dissatisfaction in in marriages, it was interesting to note that even because they studied marriages where there were no kids, but the same amount of time married, even in the marriages where there were no children, there was a decrease. But it wasn't as drastic. But there was a decrease. And so I think that speaks to the fact, too, that some of what we'll discuss today uh, to to be thriving is directly related to having children. But some of it is a lot more about uh, continuing to build our marriage God's way as the years go by. When our marriage is no longer shiny and new, if you would. And my wife's going to share a little bit about that right here. So often we can get to a place in our marriage where we're just discouraged, where it feels too hard um and this you know i know i felt at times like i can't believe we're here again um you know we make some progress and then 
we just are right back. It seems like we're right back to our old patterns. And this can lead to us wanting to quit. Not quit as in divorce, but quit trying to understand. Um, mm -hmm. Quit being patient. Quit trying harder. Quit learning and growing in our marriage. And, you know, when kids come, it just feels like we're on the go from the minute we wake up until the last kid is asleep and then we need to clean the kitchen. Um, and marriage can take a back seat. Uh, it can be overwhelming balancing being a mom and then switching to wife mode. Keeping a marriage healthy, it's hard. You know, there's fatigue, there's fear, um, complacency. All of those things can come into play. Um, wanting to quit growing and changing and learning in marriage, it's a constant temptation. And sometimes it's not even on the docket. We're just trying to make it through the day. And there's no just once and for all answer. And really, our only solution is Jesus. Um, throwing ourselves before him, surrendering our will and our heart to him. And not just in crisis, um, but in everyday challenges, in everyday normalcy. Um, Jesus is the only hope for our marriages to really thrive. Our differences in male, female, the differences in how we were raised, um, yeah. our different ideas of parenting, and a hundred other things keep us on the verge of disunity unless we're close to the heart of Jesus. Jesus gives us peace when fears want to rule. He gives us surrender when selfishness wants to take over. He gives us strength to keep learning and to keep listening. He comforts us when we're overwhelmed and hurt, but we have to nurture a heart that wants to please Jesus first. And Mike's gonna talk more about that. Oh, um, we are going to uh, break this down into three main topics um, that, that we've found very helpful during these years, and, and they are first proper priorities. Uh, if you can turn over to Mark chapter 12, uh, and then the other two we'll talk about is consistent communication and selfless servitude. Um, I would say you can remember that easily because it's PCS, but I don't know what the heck PCS <laughs> relates to or stands for. Please, so. <laughs> Please Christ save us. He just came up with one so, right here. So uh, let's talk about proper priorities. You know, as Jody mentioned, that life can get crazy, especially when you add kids into the mix. And, and we haven't even talked about the fact that you may be dealing with children who have special needs. You know, if you're talking about blended families, there's another dynamic there. Um, but here in Mark 12, verse 28, I, I know you're familiar with this. It says, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And notice what Jesus doesn't say here. When asked what's the greatest commandment, he doesn't say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength until you have children. <laughs> and then rework your priorities. He doesn't say that. And yet, that's what I've seen happen in many marriages. It's what we've certainly faced as temptations in our own marriage. I believe most people at least face the temptation to do this once the responsibility of raising children is added to life. And it's the very thing, as Jesus told the parable of the sower, that we're aware of, that he warned that worries of this life and desire for other things will choke out the word making us unfruitful. And so what are the order of priorities we should have with all these different relationships we're responsible for? The number one is relationship with God. For those of you who have infants, I'm just going to briefly hit on this. And if you've had other children, your infant now is a second one. Maybe you've already figured this out. But you've got to figure out how to still have time with God, with an infant, and I can tell you what helped with us. What helped with us was communicating, hey, I'll, you know, I'll take over for this hour, and you go do whatever it is you do with God. Prayer walk, that kind of stuff, and then we switch it. And that might be in the morning, that might be in the evening. It's whenever you can figure it out when they're at that age. Another thing was in the stroller, taking a walk together, and praying together. 
during that time, figuring that out. A couple of things that helped with that. But in talking about our relationship with God, I, I don't want to talk just about our prayer and time in God's word, but really more the attitude that Paul communicates in 2 Corinthians 5, 9. He says very simply, a very simple concept and yet very profound and important. He says, we make it our goal to please him. Amen. That should be singularly how we approach our marriage, no matter what stage of life it is. And in that, we can ask, then are my priorities in line with what is pleasing to God? And here's a mindset that I don't even like it as I say it, but it's been so important for me to embrace. And I have to tell myself this over and over again. And it's this. The goal of marriage is not my happiness. It's my holiness. The goal of marriage is not your happiness. It's your holiness. Because see, oftentimes we'll ask a question as we approach whatever it is, what's going to make me happy? Or if you're really being, you're the selfless one. You're asking, what will make my spouse happy? Even that, where it sounds noble, isn't the question you should be asking. Right. Wow. The question you should be asking is, what will make God happy? What will please him? Because marriage, as awesome as it is designed by God to be, it's temporary. Jesus is very clear there will be no marriage at the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a marriage class. <laughs> <laughs> but see, marriage is designed by God to help us get to heaven. Wow. That's right. To help us get to heaven, not just to bring us temporary happiness in this life. And if we aim to please God in our marriage, we'll experience joy in this life. But the ultimate happiness that is to be brought through our relationship. And if I love her with all my heart, like God calls me to, this will be the only thing that really matters to me about her is that the day she stands before the creator, she will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. That should be of utmost concern to me for her. Because love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is the most important priority, even when kids come on the scene. And we've got to make sure that we don't allow this priority to get crowded into the background by the responsibility of raising children. Amen. Come on. We get tempted to compromise our time with God. We get tempted to compromise time with God's people. We get tempted to compromise giving our time and resources. We, we get tempted to compromise being involved in the mission of making disciples because of all that's now on our plate. And we've got to fight that getting squeezed out. You know, not only does our relationship with God get challenged by children coming on the scene, so does our relationship with our spouse. And the second priority is your relationship with your spouse. I don't know what you've been told, but when you look at Jesus' command there, love your neighbor as yourself, the second is like it, the number one neighbor on your list is your spouse, <laughs> not your children. Now, your children demand attention, which requires time and energy that perhaps used to go to your spouse. That's why, again, that number one factor for the wives' decrease in marital satisfaction is this added responsibility that's there. But see, children, and, and children, the thing is, is children bring out a tremendous emotion in us. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's actually a good thing. And we bond with them, and we want to connect with them, and we want to provide for them. But children were never designed by God to take the place of our spouse. The number, again, the number one factor for husbands of the decrease in marital satisfaction was that lack of time together. And we have tremendous responsibility as parents, but there's only one human relationship that God describes as one flesh. And that's the one with your spouse, not your child. And one flesh isn't simply describing the sexual relationship, but the deep intimacy, the oneness we have on a spiritual level, an emotional level, and a physical level. And during disappointing or challenging times in marriage, 
children can become the source of security for one of or both of the spouses. There's a vulnerability not required with your child that is required with your spouse. And so a lot of times it's easier to go get that security from this time with my child through stressful times. And that's not how God designed that relationship. Love your neighbor. Your spouse is the number one. You know, the challenges that come with making this a reality actually provide great opportunity for training your children that the world does not revolve around them. And my wife's going to share a couple of practical things that we've implemented uh, in our marriage in this particular area. Um, one of the things we did when our kids were really young is um, when we, we, we called it like couch time. So like when Mike was working out of the home, when he would get home, we would spend 15 minutes just us on the couch. And we explained to our kids that this is mommy and daddy time, um, their special time. And when we're done, then you can play with daddy or whatever. Um, and we would just sit them down with books or toys and it accomplished a few things. One, it taught them self-discipline and not to interrupt. Um, it taught them that though they're an important part of the family, our family does not revolve around them. Um, and it brought security to our kids, like mom and dad love each other. And lastly, it helped us stay connected and in a very tangible way, put the marriage first. Um, and then the other thing, you know, when your kids get a little bit older and like sports come into play and like activities, that can be very challenging because that's just, you're just, you know, everywhere. And so we would just limit, we, or we currently, we just limit our kids to like one activity at a time. And so that just makes it more manageable and we don't lose the marriage and the family and all of that. Uh, amen. And not to make this a parenting class, which we had to really fight to do as we were putting this together because they meld so much together. But one thing on that couch time that we did, it's not like one day all of a sudden we're going to spend 15 minutes and our kids just have this magical discipline of minding themselves for 15 minutes. It did take training them, which started with like two minutes. We're going to time it. You can't move for two minutes. You know, and you time it and built up to it. But in that, it helped them grow in understanding the world doesn't revolve around them and, and again an important concept understand you're going to have your children for 18 years and then they're going to move on and who's going to be left you two are going to be left and if you haven't done this for those 18 years you're going to be strangers and we've really we on our honeymoon I believe God blessed us we witnessed a couple in that stage of life who every morning at breakfast had no clue what to say to each other. And it put on our radar at the very beginning, we've got to make sure we never end up there. Where we're strangers at that point in life. Um, of course, we need to have a great relationship with our children. Um, but relationship with spouse has to have priority over that. You know, as well, there's relationships with others. A part of loving your neighbor for a disciple of Jesus involves serving others in the church, involves reaching out to the lost. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in detail in our third section here of selfless service. But I'm imagining, even as I go through this, now nah, thinking, man, now that we're completely overwhelmed with the prioritization of our relationship with God and my spouse over my children, but I've also got to be a great parent to my child and now I've got to serve other people the lost all of that let's look at Mark 14 again I think an important mindset to have with this so that you aren't in a place of being overwhelmed that leads to a place of paralysis and this is impossible and the story here I'm not going to read the whole story again I'm sure you're familiar the uh, uh, woman who other, uh, other passages say is Mary has come in and and anointed Jesus with an expensive perfume, and then she gets criticized for it. But look what Jesus says in verse 8. He comes to her defense and says she did what she could. <clears throat> Think that mindset of doing what we can is huge. Because once the responsibilities of life increase, we can often get focused on what I can no longer do. Well, you're talking about my relationship with God. I can't go away for an hour on the mountaintop anymore. 
to spend time with God. We can't get these extended romantic times away that we used to get. I can't go up on campus and share my faith for two hours straight anymore. And we get so focused on what we can no longer do. Whereas we should be focused on, okay, what can I do? In this mode of giving my best to God, we've got to figure out in every stage of life, what does my best for God look like at this stage in my life? I know it's very different for me now than it was when I was a college student. I've gone through some major health challenges. My best for God looked very different during times of major health challenges. But I still needed to give my best to God. So we've got to ask, what can I do? And Carlos and Jessica are going to come up and share a little bit about this mentality um, and approaching it in this stage of life. Um, Thank you. So um, Carlos and Jessica, we've been married 13 years, and we're right in that time of life. Our kids are eight and five. Uh, You know, half of our marriage has been no kids, and the other half has been hits you like a brick wall, right? When you have that first child, you're just like, oh my God, the stuff that we have to do to keep a child alive, right? Like diapers <laughs> and feeding, and you're just like, wow. And you know, for us, we just really had to like start to think about, we can't, we can't be prisoners to the needs of our children. Like we really need to be disciples. And I think, you know, for us, you know, being in the campus ministry, we just had so much passion. We actually wanted to go into the ministry at one time to really serve and to really help and to really give. And we were very, very active. And so when we had kids, it was a huge challenge. I mean, simple tasks was tough. It was like, I'm out of half and half. What is it going to take to get to this store? I got to change a diaper. I got to put a kid in a car seat. I got to pack a stroller. I got to bring some Cheerios. I, I'm like, that. <laughs> and the store's across the street. You know, and I'm just like, <laughs> I just go, you know what? Black is awesome. You know, black coffee's good. You know? <laughs> and that's the reality of it, right? And so we, we started to go, you know what? We have to make our kids a part of evangelism. So we started doing things like we have an annual gingerbread house making party with anyone that my kid goes to school with, either one, preschool, uh, elementary school, we invite as many people as we come over, and we just have a blast, and you know, this last year was great, we had a couple come over, uh, we were trying to reach out to them, and the kids got sick, and they came over, he's like, look, I can only be here for five minutes, we just came to just say hi, and we said, you know what, we're going to pack everything up for you, we made them a gingerbread to go house kit, so that when their kids got better, they can actually do it, and they, it still rings true in their minds, we didn't see them for several months, they saw us two days ago, they went out of their ways to come and talk to us because they just remember that generosity. They remember the times. Loving other people's kids is one of the most important things you can yeah. do. Um, you know, we just uh, volunteer. Get involved with your kids. There's a brother in the L.A. church, his name's Ralph Lua. He got volunteer for the entire L.A. district at an elementary school because he did so many activities with his kids at school day after day after day, week after week. It's pretty impressive what you can do Mm -hmm. with your children. The other thing I do is I serve the church with my kids. My son is eight, and he has done lighting and run cable and gone to churches. For the last three Christmas plays, that kid is involved doing something, and I do it with him. And I even simple tasks like, hey, you're going to stand here, and you're just going to count kids, and you're going to tell me how many microphones we need. He's like, okay, one. (laughs) (laughs) You know, get them involved early. Get them involved young. Take them with you when you serve. And that's such a a big, big thing for them as well. Mm -hmm. And and you really, you you connect that with them. I want them to know that dad is serving. I want them to know that dad is involved, that the church is a priority for me. Serving other people is a priority. Um, I'll let Jessica share as well. Yeah, so I think uh, kids are a sharing your faith magnet. Seriously, like they call me, like the moms call me. Oh, I want to I wanna have a play date with Luna. And, um, or Giancarlo, you know, get invited to a birthday party. And then I get a chance to talk to the moms and get to know them and then the kids it's amazing like you are an example to them the way you act the way you talk to to the grown-ups they learn how to interact with other kids and and the the parents are like oh my gosh your kids are so wonderful and you know so this you know you're so lucky we are not lucky we are training our kids to be godly and that's the thing god has given us this gift to 
to make it to to shine to so that, in, that we can glorify God through them. Right. Yeah. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, your kids are your biggest testimony. You know, if your if your kids are not godly, there's a reason, and people notice. You know, but imagine you guys are having a hard time with this, and you have God in your lives. What are people in the world going through? And if they see you show up happy, willing to volunteer, your kids aren't crying, your kids want to help, what kind of impact does that make to other people? You become that magnet, and it's happened to us before. We feel like we're always reaching out to couples, and people are always talking to us because we feel like we've really, really tried to push our kids into understanding that you know, God is the center of our life and serving is the center of life. It's not a burden. It's an opportunity. Yeah. If you really sit down and think, what can we do? It'd be amazing what you come up with yeah. and the impact God it can have for God. But also, remember Jesus' attitude toward he'll look at it and go, he's doing what he can do. She's yeah. doing what they can do. Yeah. And he's excited about that. Let's look at the second thing, consistent communication. Two Proverbs I want to share at the beginning of this, and then we'll talk about some specifics. Um, uh, But as you're turning over to Proverbs chapter 12, or as I'm turning there, again, priorities, God, your spouse, your children, and then others. Um, They're all important, but just keep them in the proper order. (laughs) Proverbs 12, verse 18, as we talk about communication, Verse 18 says, reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Then in Proverbs 15, verse 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And so with communication, first there's the issue to make sure we are communicating. But there's also from these Proverbs, how are we communicating? And good communication rates near the top of characteristics needed for a healthy marriage in every study done in, in the arena that studies that stuff. And it's even more so once children are in the mix, because once children come along, we can no longer just do our own thing and hope it works out. Like, well, I had something planned, and she had something planned, and we're going to do it, because who's going to feed the kids? You know, Who's going to uh, get them to school once they're that age? Who's going to help them with their homework? if we don't communicate. And, you know, Jody mentioned how we trained our kids to sit by themselves while we talked. Um, uh, Now, for us, as they're a little bit older, this area is still huge. Mm. To be able to communicate and to be able to prioritize that, just recently we had a conversation where we were like, hey, we need to make sure we connect on a daily basis. And so we set 15, after the kids go to bed, 15 minutes we're going to talk about the day, and we don't time it. Ever. I mean, sometimes it goes a little less than that. Sometimes it goes more. But it's something we've had to come back to. Like, man, we've got to make sure we're doing this and connecting uh, in our lives, even at this stage. But here's some specific areas I want to encourage that we make sure we're communicating in that, that we've had to make sure of and had tough, uh, good at some, not good at others. The first one is, are we communicating our expectations? You know, a very big necessity of communication in this particular stage of life is communicating expectations because oftentimes spouses will complain of disappointment of unmet expectations. And yet very often those expectations haven't been communicated very clearly. They might be very clear in our own mind, and we may have given subtle cues, but there's never been direct communication. And discussion about expectations. You know, I, I, again, in my experience, a lot of couples will come up with expectation lists while they're engaged or early on in their married life and then never do it again. We did that. When we were engaged, we, you know, here's kind of expectations I have going into marriage. She gave me hers. I actually still have that. I have that in the, fr- it's not in this Bible, it's in the front of my other Bible, my study Bible. I have that along with a picture from our wedding in there. And I have it, quite honestly, more for sentimentality's sake, because those expectations have completely changed (laughs) from what they were right there. But that's the point, is expectations change over time. So if we're not continuing to communicate them, there's going to be a lot of disappointment going on. And as Tom talked about, at least to the guys, I mean, that, or maybe the two classes ran together, maybe you talked about to all of us, but that can become a simmering bitterness underneath that exists 
uh, between us. And I know we've had a lot of life changes that have completely changed expectations. I mentioned the health issues I had. About a year into our marriage, got very sick and was sick for about 10 years. Expectations changed because abilities changed. So responsibilities changed. Um, and it was an adjustment period, a lot of communication about expectations. Having the first child, expectations change. Having the second child, <laughs> expectations changed. You know, we went through a time where she became a stay-at-mom, stay-at-home mom. Expectations changed when that happened. You know, a time where I had a job that I was traveling a lot more than before. Expectations changed. And so we've got to make sure that we're communicating. I will throw this out there. If you haven't communicated clearly expectations in over a year, I encourage you to do that. To sit down and have that kind of conversation, it could involve chores. It might involve your sexual relationship. It, whatever arena it is for you to communicate those. And I'm going to add one thing to that. Because if one or both of you, if you do that and come back together, feel like these are unrealistic, <laughs> bounce them off of another couple. Yeah. We've had that. We had a couple who... They did that. We were helping them. They came back. The guy had like six expectations. The wife had four pages of expectations. And so we had to sit down to help them come to what's realistic in this. And so have people help you if that's it. Second area of communication, standards. Kids are in the mix now. Things like, what are we going to allow the kids to watch on TV, movies? What games are we going to allow them to play? What extracurricular activities will they be involved in? Are we going to allow these extracurricular activities to interfere with church? You need to be yeah. communicating about these things because you might have very different thought patterns about it. Yeah. With our daughter, she's a stud at volleyball. And she's recruited for this club stuff. And we've had to talk. And, and, and it's an appeal but almost every tournament is an all-day Sunday tournament. And so we've had to discuss, and we're like, no club volleyball for her. There's going to be other arenas to help her pursue her stuff. But that's something for us to communicate. Amen. Here's the expectation, and here's our standards. We've got to communicate through those things. Amen. Our decisions in these areas shape our children's values, but they also provide fertile ground for disagreement between us we've got to communicate but in communicating we've got to remember our goal is not to get our spouse on the same page as us right our goal is for both of us to get on the same page with god Amen. in this you know one area in theory jody and i very early on agreed on spanking our children for appropriate things we agreed on the offenses of disobedience lying and complaining would involve spanking. So in theory, we're on the same page. This is awesome. But one of the things she fought with that was sentimentality. Oh, they're so cute. Oh, they're so small. Oh, she, she battled with that. I didn't. But I battled with anger. And that shouldn't be done out of anger. They're not getting spanked because they ticked me off. You can spank because they disobeyed God. And this is about them and God, not them and me. And so, where in theory we're on the same page, it took a lot of communication for us to help each other overcome our weaknesses in that area. She was very helpful in me with my anger. In this. But we had to have honest dialogue. I was very helpful to her in dealing with the sentimentality, and that's not going to be cute at age 13. We had to, but we had to help each other through those things. Additionally, during that time that she became the stay-at-home mom, the dynamic of discipline changed. For a little while, it became almost the, not that she said this, but the wait till dad gets home. So after all day with mom, as soon as dad walks in the door, they're getting disciplined. And it hurt the dynamic between me and my children. 
And so we had to have a discussion about discipline, and she took on a greater role in terms of disciplining them during that time. A lot of communication on this about the standards we're going to do. You know, and in all our efforts to communicate about expectations, about standards in order to prevent disappointment, resentment, criticalness, there still will be times that we disagree. How do we communicate during those times? Times where we're not meeting each other's needs. How do we communicate? And that's those proverbs I read. Will we use reckless words or wise words? Will we use humble and gentle words or harsh words? Right now, the Ortegas are going to come back up again and uh, talk here a little bit about uh, being humble towards each other in our communication uh, with this. Yeah, we, we call it arguing the right way. And so that's, you know, for us, that's, uh, it's really important. Um, you guys are two different people. How many of you married the exact same person, same temperament, same opinions, <laughs> right? You're gonna argue, <laughs> it's just a matter of fact. And so, you know, one of the things that, uh, I'm gonna just talk to the brothers, there's two things. One is when your wife approaches you and then when you need to approach your wife. So I think the first thing for me, when, when my wife approaches me and it's, it's so easy to get on the defensive immediately, right? Because I just feel like you're picking at me as a man, you're just trying to tell me what to do. You just want to put me in this box that you call husband, and I, I know I'm, I'm right, you know. And that's that's my <laughs> my natural instinct. And you know, we we actually in our men's lesson earlier today, we talked about really listening. And I really want to challenge the brothers to do two things further than listening. I want you to, be able to not just digest what your wife is saying, but then also ask a question about what she's saying, and then I want you to repeat back to her what she said. And those things have really helped me a lot. She'll say, you know, hey, I don't like it, or this happens, or we need to work on this. And I'll go, okay, so what you're saying, and let me, let me understand this correctly, this is what you're saying, okay, and this is how it makes you feel. And this is, is that correct? Yes, it is, okay. And then it allows me to really process and really try to put myself in her shoes. Like, if I was Jessica and I had a deal with a husband that did this, would that make me happy? Would that help me be more godly? And I think ultimately I had to look in my own heart and I said, you know, the reason why I'm so defensive is because I'd rather be right than I'd rather be godly. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it came down to for me was I was more in a self perseverance, right stage, husband, dominant, need to be this guy rather than be a godly man who really serves, loves, and listens to their wives. And I go, and that's really tough. And so, you know, I, I would really you know, urge you guys to take those two extra steps. Um, on the flip side, when, when you're talking to your wife, and for me, I don't know how you guys are, I'm the, I'm the bottler. I will bottle and bottle and bottle, and then I just implode one day. And it could be something small, right? Like she put peas on my plate instead of carrots. I was like, they're not even the same color. Like, <laughs> like what? I, I don't even like peas. How do you not know that? And it's just months of stuff that I haven't gotten out, right? And I just explode. And what I've realized is I've really got to learn how to communicate when things bother me. Because everything, every seed in your heart does grow. And I'll give you a quick example, and it's a funny example. But we bought these cups, coffee cups. It's a cup I use every day. Love it. Awesome cups. They match everything in the house. You know, like, it's great. And it's my favorite. But when she puts them away at night, she, our initials are on the front. The initials are facing the back of the cabinet. Okay? So I open it up. And the first thing I think of, I have a 50% chance of getting this right. Okay? That's my first thought, okay? Okay, wrong. I know this by you know, default, this has to be the cup. I did this for four months, and for four months, every morning, I was critical of my wife because she didn't know how to put cups away. So when she got up, where I saw her, the first thing I thought of, the non-cup pooper away person. You know, she doesn't know how to do it. <laughs> and I didn't want to talk to her about it. And when I finally did, she just goes, oh, that's... That's easy and dumb. I could easily do that. And she changed it. And since then, when I open the cabinet, believe it or not, I actually have a positive reaction in my heart. Because I go, oh, there's the C. <laughs> and it's so small. But if you imagine, if you have three, four, five, six of those things in your heart, and you're not willing to talk about it, and you're not willing to really put it out there, it's gonna grow, it's gonna fester, and you're just gonna get critical. I've had some of the worst critical thoughts out of my own selfishness. You know, one time I was like, man, I don't know what she did. I'm gonna follow her around the whole day and track everything that she does, because I was convinced that I didn't know what she was doing, and I just thought there could definitely be more going around her. I once even thought to enroll her in culinary school. Like, that's how bad it gets. Like, you get so critical if you don't talk about it. Like, and to my own shame, 
because all those things were selfishly driven, mm. very, wow. very selfishly driven, because I wasn't willing to be godly more than I wanted to be right. Mm. So. Yeah, and I think uh, you need to know your wife or husband. You need to get to know each other. And what is it that bothers the other person? Like, I know that he just bottles things up in, her, in his heart. And I know there's something is wrong, but he won't tell me. So I have to, like, so what's wrong? And I have to ask questions. But I know that about him. So then I think that's how you can argue the right way when you get to know the other person. And you, get, and you need to know yourself, too. Like, my biggest struggle is to say things right away without thinking. I just say things that can hurt his feelings because to me it's like, why don't you just do the trash right now? You know, or, or like I just, you know, I can just say something really diminishing to him. And, and I need to, to, like I think if we put ourselves together and we really examine each other, like we can really um, make a really perfect person. Okay. <laughs> no, but, but I think that you need to know each other. You need to know each other and you need to know yourself and be humble and listen to the other person. What is he trying to say? You know, like that doesn't sound very good. And if it doesn't sound good to you, ask someone like uh, to get together another couple and another couple can help. Yeah, and, and I'll end it with this. I think there's two things that, that we've learned is you, you can't solve every argument in your life. You just can't do it and you will never be able to. I think you gotta know when to get people involved. And you got to know when to pray together. Sometimes, you know, we've been in arguments where we actually got into one last night. It was pretty hilarious. She goes, check your notes. I was like, all right. Well, <laughs> yes. You know, but that's just us. We're very, you know, we get into it, but we, we always try to find that, that right path. And there's been times when I just go, you know what? Like neither one of us is, is being godly. Like we're just not. I have mm -hmm. enough sense to know that I'm super angry. I'm very upset. I'm very emotional. I'm very hurt and you're the same way and we're not getting anywhere, why don't we just pray in front of God because another one of us can be prideful in front of God. Let's just pray together about the situation. We don't even have to resolve it, but if you just pray about the situation before God together, mm -hmm. a lot of that times it really, it really does help. It really softens yeah. your heart, you yeah. know? And, I, and you gotta know when to get other people involved. I mean, there's times where we're just like, you know what, this isn't going anywhere. Let's let's get these people on the phone. Let's let's reach out right away. We yeah. can't let it fester. Uh, you know, like they talked about, there there's a shelf life for this, and it is it is same day. Do not let the sun go down, and while you're still angry. So. Thank you guys. Um, honestly, the technique he talked about. If if you need, if you find yourself stuck in this area of communicating, and and the dynamic he talked about of repeating back. Just Google this. It's actually a technique within the counseling world. Google speaker listener technique. And it will outline for you how to communicate that way that is actually listening to the other person. So um, while communicating, communication involving areas of needs, providing corrections for each other, getting on the same page, they're all important. I think there's an area of communication that oftentimes we forget the power and necessity it has, and that's communicating gratitude. To each other. Um, I had a story I was going to share with you, but I think we're running late on time, so I'll skip that on it. But I do think that the idea is creating a culture of appreciation. Basic things like, thanks for doing the laundry. Thank you for dinner. You know, think just communicating gratitude. Um, and it's kind of funny, you, you may be at a point, I don't know where everybody's at in their marriage, where, man, there is nothing in our marriage to communicate right now. You might be at that point. And I remember, I say that because I remember brother who was sharing about this where he knew their marriage was at the point that that was the case. And he, he just shared, I hate my wife. Like that's the point he was at, but he knew he needed to get to a different place. So he just said, I'm going to start with this gratitude. He said the first day he could just couldn't come up with one thing. And so what he came up with was, I'm grateful she brushes her teeth every morning. <laughs> that's where he started. But that's where he was at. It was a starting point, And it built to where it needed to be. And it was amazing how quickly through doing that, he no longer hated his wife. A culture of appreciation. We do that with our kids. Recently, one of the 
family devotional things we did was on the fruits of the Spirit. So we read Galatians 5 and uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And we said we're going to have a basket and the rest for the next week we're going to create a basket of fruit. So what we did is every time you see someone else in the family exhibiting love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, or self-control, you write it out on a sheet of paper and you put it in the basket. And at the end of the week, we pulled out all these expressions of gratitude within the family for these simple signs of love, joy, peace, patience throughout the week. And the goal is uh, creating a culture of appreciation and communicating that. And I think another important thing is that our children hear from us how grateful we are for our spouse. Do they hear more our complaining about our spouse or do they hear that we're grateful? for our spouse. Again, communication of gratitude. It was touched on a little bit by Carlos and Jessica. Uh, This is almost a side note, but I think very important to communication is discipling. God never designed this to be done alone. Most of us have had people help us develop our faith to become a follower of Jesus. We then had people help us through those early days of being a Christian. We had people involved in our lives as we dated, who's now our spouse. We had people involved in our engagement and getting married. And now that life's more complex than us, ever with children we don't have people involved it really logically makes very little sense but i think most times if that happens it didn't happen intentionally like we just didn't sit down and say now that we're at the most complex time of our lives let's shut everyone else out of our lives it didn't happen that way so we've got to make sure that we're intentional about it jody and i have moved a lot My daughter's 10 and she's lived in 11 houses. We've moved a lot. And so in every new situation, it's new relationships. And we've had to decide that intentionally we will invite people into our marriage. Invite people into our family. The church is made up of people who want to help disciple you. It goes so much easier if you invite them in and ask. Make it a point, discipling. The last thing I want to talk about on communication, and then we'll rush through the rest. I know we're in our third lesson. Your brain's probably fried. Uh, But uh, I think these are super important, is prayer. How important prayer is, well, that's communicating with God. Mm. How important that is in our communication with each other. My wife's going to come up and share here a little bit about prayer. Um, So I think sometimes as women... I mean, obviously, communication with each other is very important, but I think as women, sometimes we can think we can fix things by talking and talking, and then it can turn into arguing and pleading and debating um, and confronting, and and our last resort can be prayer, um, but it needs to be our first resort. Um, When we're prayerful women, it helps us to get to a place where we're concerned, we're more concerned with what's right as opposed to who's right. We're not destined to fight. We're not destined to be emotionally disconnected. Um, We have God's power on our side. We need to be prayerful women. We've got to fight for our marriages in prayer. And about seven years ago, I found this book. I bought it on eBay for like two bucks. It's uh, The Power of a Praying Wife. And it just transformed my prayer life. It has 30 short chapters. And it's basically 30 areas that I need to pray for my husband in. So, for example, you know, his work, his finances, his sexuality, his affection, his mind, his fears, his health, his fatherhood, his past, his attitude. Like 30 different areas that I never, like I, I got this book and I felt like I've never even prayed for my husband before. Um, and so at the end of each chapter, it just... There's a prayer. There's an example of a prayer. And so what I did is I got a notebook and I just wrote out all of those prayers. And so every day I pray through one of them. And it, it's just helped my prayer life. It's helped our marriage. Um, and there's also power of a praying mom. And so I have that for my kids too. But super helpful book. And I know in theory everyone talks about prayer. I've never known a woman like my wife who actually does it. Like I know she's praying for me every day. But it's not just for the wives. 
power of a praying husband. <laughs> I have. Now, we kind of got, <laughs> the other day we were talking about, she's like, 30 things. I, no, I said, it's 20 things I'm praying through. I have my journal, pray for her, 20 different things. But I said 20 different things. She's like, 30 different things. So I was like, did I miss something? The, the, the praying husband book has 20 things. So I guess, I guess the men, we just have more to, we need prayer for. You know? So, but... Um, Let's, yeah. let's, let's jump ahead into the last point, selfless servitude. Um, there was uh, one scripture I was going to look at. I'm just going to give you the reference. You know the story. Uh, it's in Luke 7, 44 through 46, where Jesus is having a meal at the Pharisee's house. Uh, the woman comes in, wets his feet with her tears. The Pharisee's critical of Jesus. And so Jesus basically says, look, you gave me no water for my feet. You didn't give me a kiss. You didn't put oil on my head. And he commends the woman, but he criticizes the Pharisee in it. And the things that he addresses are common courtesies at that time for a rabbi. That's what he was addressing when a rabbi showed up. These were just common things you would do. It might be foreign to us, but today when someone comes to your house, what's a common courtesy? Ask him, do you want something to drink? Do you want something to drink? What else? Can I take your coat? What else? What's that? Have a seat. Have a seat. Give, them a hug. Give them a hug. Common courtesies. Now ask yourself, do I do those for my spouse? We just acknowledge their common courtesies. And yet our spouse comes home. Maybe we don't even acknowledge that they walked in the door. You know? Or maybe the first thing out of our mouth is what they can do for us. Not what we can do for them. Selfless service. You know, we had a friend who, in this area, they decided, they had this dog. We lived with him for a little bit, and this dog was big but friendly and a huge tail. Knocked my daughter flat on her back more than once when she was like two. But they decided, their, their way of implementing this is their decision was, we're going to outdo the dog. That was their thing. So when someone in the family comes home, like, for the wife, when the husband came home, I'm going to outdo the dog. You know, that was their goal. That's just the way they implemented it. But I think it's important. Philippians 2, Tom shared this in his lesson with the men. Um, but I'm going to read it. If, if there's one scripture uh, for this area, perhaps the most important for me, is this one. Verse 1 of Philippians 2, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. What if we really implemented this in our marriage? The attitude of a servant. What if we really practiced that in humility, I will consider my spouse better than me? What if we really did that? And as followers of Jesus, we're called to imitate Jesus in this. And when you think about what attracted you to your now spouse in the first place to even want to get to know him and date them and eventually marry him, it was probably something that benefited you. It probably was, and that's not even bad. Oh, well, they're attractive. I'm really attracted to them. Oh, they're very kind. Those kind of things. Nothing wrong with it, but in what Jesus teaches and, and practices, we see that our marriage isn't about how they benefit me. My marriage isn't about how she benefits me, but about how I can be a benefit to her. And the Ortega is going to share a little bit here about putting each other first. So our situation is really different than most of the couples. Like they, you know, like the husband goes to work or, or maybe both of you work like from eight, eight to five. But he actually has to travel like every week for business. So then, and he comes home and he's super busy, like he's working pretty much. He comes home and he has to work, 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 work. And I am very grateful. So I have to think, okay, I'm very grateful and thankful that he has a job and that I can stay home. So then my mindset is already fixed, even though I don't like it, uh, but I pray and I pray for him. I pray for his job. I pray for 
you know, to be, I, I am very grateful that he has a very wonderful, wonderful job. But I have to know my situation and how am I gonna work with my situation? My situation is, might be difficult. You know, your situation might be very difficult. But how are you gonna make it work? Yeah. How are you going to to uh, let God guide you to have a a godly uh, marriage, and uh, you're gonna be godly parents? And um, so, like when he comes home, you know, I don't. I, I know he's exhausted. I know he's been working hard. He's mentally beat. So I don't just I don't tell him, honey, I need you to do this, I need to do that. He doesn't he doesn't cook, he doesn't clean, he doesn't do anything of that. He does it he does it out, out of his own <laughs> he does it out of his own heart. Like when he gets a chance, he's like, Oh, I'm gonna cook for you. And and uh, on, on or like for example on Saturday uh, nights, he's like, you know what? I'm gonna cook for you every Saturday. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I love that. That's like, I hate cooking because I'm cooking every day, three times a, you know? And so then that's, that's how he serves me. And he understand, we understand each other's situation. And I'm not gonna be against that because it is what it is and we have to make it work. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think, you know, just a couple things is, you know, I, you know for, for me serving her, like I really tried to, Put things in the calendar like she said you like saturday night is it's my night and i own it and i try my very best to make the best meal the best thing i can do and, he clean, and cleans and, and and that means clean the the, the whole thing Kid <laughs> clean you know sometimes you know little kids you cook three meals spaghetti with chop you know cheese spaghetti with sauce red sauce you know and then mom wants something there you're just like good lord but yeah you know <laughs> that's just the reality of life but i go you know really uh, for me, you know, my wife, she really understands my, my needs because I'm so busy, because I'm so involved in so many things. You know, she just takes care of it. And she kind of like cleans the aisleways and lets me just kind of plow through what I need to plow through. And it's so important for me not to get distracted because I really need to get, you know, uh, I'm in a part of my career that's just the most stressful it's ever been. I travel 140 days a year and I work almost every weekend. And so it is so important to me for her to really take care of those things. And I remember, it was two weeks ago, I said, hey, I'm gonna take care of the kids on Monday. I'm home, you know, and one day that I tried to do her job, I said, I gave my kids the wrong breakfast. I sent my son to school with no lunch. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> he was late to Lego. I didn't even know there was Lego class. I was like, what, there's what? You know, like I, the homework folders were incomplete and wrong. I just was like, I don't even know what I'm doing. You know, like, and it just, you know, just understanding that, um, you know, and for me, you know, like I, my biggest need, honestly, because I travel so much is affection and, you know, is sex. And she, you know, she's very good about understanding where I'm at. And, you know, we kind of have this, you know, unspoken role in our house the day before I leave, you know, she's very good about it. She's like, and hey, take your pants off. We're going, you know, <laughs> <laughs> she has said that verbatim, you know, like she just locked the door, take your pants off. Let's go. You know, and I'm just like, all right, it's 1030. I got a flight in the morning, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's, it's simple things like that where I just go you know she's just willing to just do what it takes to really serve me as a husband regardless if I have a bad week regardless if I have a bad day wow. you know that consistency speaks so much volume and love yeah. and I think one more thing um, connection you know it's so important to stay connected like uh, when he's home every single day the kids go to bed at 8 o'clock 8:30. We sit down on the couch, we put something random on the TV, and we just talk. You know, sometimes we go to bed until like 12. I mean, we just like can't, you know, like we have that habit of staying connected. Like we know what, how we think, we know how we feel, we know what, what our needs are that day or that week or that month or whatever. So staying connected. We're going to bring this in for a landing. Um, I want to give you a um, couple of assignments. Actually, at the very end, we actually have a little printout with some of the points and the assignments we'll talk about and uh, some questions to consider. But in this area, ask your spouse what's one thing you can do in the coming month to be a better servant in your marriage. And I say one thing intentionally to not overwhelm. You know, we could probably give each other 10 things and then be paralyzed. But um, one thing, 
And then the last thing, you'll see the scripture on the sheet. I'm not even going to look at it at this point. But the concept, we need to serve each other in our marriage. We also need to serve with our marriage. And uh, Carlos and Jessica talked great about that at the beginning. But in that, discuss with your spouse what's one way we can be a servant with our marriage this summer. And maybe it's within the church. Maybe it's in the neighborhood, whatever it might be. But as we close out, you know, marriage is not designed by God to simply make us happy in this life, but to provide us with someone who can help us faithfully walk the journey that allows us to experience eternal joy with our Father in heaven. We've covered some ways to keep our marriage on that path. Proper priorities, God, then your spouse, then your children, then others. Some areas of consistent communication, being selfless servants in our marriage. Sometimes this journey will sail along smoothly, Other times it'll have some turbulence. Occasionally it might feel like everything is crashing down. And so the thing I want to conclude with is no matter what step or stage you're in with that, persevere. Persevere. Remember the vows that you made in good times or in bad, in sickness or in health, for richer or for poorer, until death separates us. That's the vow. And I wanted to close out just sharing with you one thing that's helped me with that. You know, during a very challenging time of life, um, in, in many areas, back in 2004, you know, I was at work and, and Juddy had made me lunch and I opened my lunchbox and, fa- you know, folded up a sheet of paper in my lunchbox. So I pulled it out and um, found this in there. Is uh, lyrics... To a song, you, you may be familiar with the song. Uh, it's "I Will Be Here" by Stephen Curtis Chapman. But in a very tough time, this is what I opened up to. It said, "Tomorrow morning, if you wake up and the sun does not appear, I will be here. If in the dark we lose sight of love, hold my hand and have no fear, because I will be here. I will be here when you feel like being quiet. When you need to speak your mind, I will listen, and I will be here." I still get emotional. When the laughter turns to crying, through the winning, losing, and trying. Tomorrow morning, if you wake up and the future is unclear, I will be here. And our future was very unclear at that point. I will be here so you can cry on my shoulder. When the mirror tells us we're older, I will hold you. And I will be here to watch you grow in beauty and tell you all the things you are to me. I will be true to the promise I've made to you and to the one who gave you to me. And it meant so much to me then, but it still sticks with me to this day. Because it'll be like this throughout it. But I pray you can have that same spirit toward each other through whatever stages and hills and valleys that you go through in your marriage as well. Uh, I want to thank Carlos and Jessica for sharing your life and being so vulnerable with this, and my wife as well. Uh, we do have those sheets. I think we were supposed to have a Q&A time, but we're at the end of our time. And uh, you guys are, uh, thanks for listening. I mean, I know this is the third class in a busy afternoon, and uh, why don't we just close it out? And, uh, so.